All right, welcome back. Today we are starting our discussion of the special senses. We will see here the different parts of the eye. We're going to have a, an understanding of the physiology of the vision, how vision takes place. We're going to understand how the sense of smell is produced and we're going to learn the structures and functions of the ear and we're going to discuss together the physiology of hearing and equity starting first with the vision first before we start our discussion of the vision we need to have a general overview of the structure of the eye if we're looking on here we will see that the eye is going to be kept inside a bony socket. This is my orbit. And if we see on here, we're going to have muscles that would be attached to the eye lobe, to the eyeball. And you will see that the superior and inferior eyelids are covering the anterior surface of the eye. If we look at on here, the inside of the eyelids, either the superior or inferior eyelids, along with the external part of the eyeball, it's going to be, they will be covered by a membrane. We call the membrane here is the conjunctiva. We call the part of the conjunctiva that covers the eyeball, this is the bulbar conjunctiva. And the part of the conjunctiva that will be lining the eyelid from inside, this is my palpebral conjunctiva. If a person got an inflammation of the membrane here that would be lining the eyelid and covering the eyeball from outside, we call this as a conjunctivitis. If we see the two parts of the conjunctiva, we'll see that we have a part of it that is not near, that is neither covering the eyeball from outside or lining the eyelid from inside. We call this as my conjunctival sac. What is the main function of the conjunctiva here? It's going to be to release the mucus secretions that will be lubricating the eye from outside and reduce the friction between the eyelid and the eyeball preventing the formation of ulceration to the cornea for example looking at the structure of the eyeball we will see that the eyeball itself is going to be formed of three layers An outer fibrous layer, we call this outer fibrous layer. That will be opaque, forming the main skeleton of the eyeball. This is the sclera. And the anterior part of this fibrous layer is going to be clear. We call this is my cornea. Deeper to the fibrous layer formed by the sclera and the cornea, we've got the vascular layer. This is the layer that contains the blood vessels that will give the nutrition to the sclera and the cornea, as well as to the internal layer, as we're going to see in a second. The vascular layer has an anterior part. This is called the iris. 
And the iris, as you see on here, has a hole through which the light ray is going to be traveling. We call this hole located in the iris is the pupil. Surrounding the iris, we've got the ciliary body. that will be holding the lens of the eye in its place by very thin ligaments. We call those are the suspensory ligaments. And again, what do we call this part that surrounds the iris? It's my ciliary body. And this clear part through which the light is going to be traveling. and converse to fall focused on the retina. This is the lens of the eye. As a continuation of the vascular layer lining the remaining part of the sclera, we call this internal lining of the sclera. This is my choroid what choroid did you, did you hear about just before the break what choroid did you hear about Did you hear the word choroid before? Choroid plexus. What was the choroid plexus? Do you remember what was the choroid plexus? It was part of, remember? the diencephalon to be more specific it was part of my epithalamus of the diencephalon and if you remember the choroid plexus was the part of the brain that's going to be producing the cerebrospinal fluid the csf here it's not the choroid plexus it's the choroid just the choroid this is the part the vascular part on here that's going to be lining the inside of the sclera. Deeper to the choroid, you've got the neural layer. Which mainly going to be formed of the retina. The retina on here, this is going to be the nervous layer that will be responsible to detect the light and transform this light into electrical impulses that will be conducted to the brain. Through cranial nerve number two, which is my optic nerve. Again, the inside on here, it's my retina. We divide the inside of the eyeball into two main segments. From the cornea to the lens. We call it the anterior 
segment from the lens until you get to the retina. We call this segment of the eye. It's the posterior segment. The anterior segment is going to be filled with a watery substance. We call this watery substance filling the anterior segment of the eye. This is my aqueous humor. Compared to the posterior segment of the eye is going to be filled by a gelatinous substance that will be like a glass. We call this is my vitreous humor. If you're looking right now at the screen of your device, please focus on this point right here. Just focus on this point. Look at this point, this X inside the circle. Can you still see this bird? If you look at this X, can you still see this bird? What do you think? Yes or no? Is it with the same quality? Not in details. Is it with the same quality? What do you think? If you're looking at this X here, you still see the bird, but not with the same quality, right? Not in detail. Why? Because what you are looking at gonna be focused on part of your retina that has better vision. We call this is here. Not sure what's going on. We call this region on the retina the macula lutea. Macula lutea. And it has a central part in it. This is called the fovea centralis. Fovea centralis is the central part of the macula lutea. So in order for you to get an idea about what you are able to see on here, if this is the eye, like this, I have a superior view of the eye and the vision field. The vision field is emitting light that travels like this. in the form of light rays. All of the light rays will fall in different on different parts of your retina, like what you see on here. So the retina here 
is going to be collecting the light from the different parts of the vision field. This is everything that I can see. This is all the vision field. Each part of the vision field is going to be emitting light and those light rays going to fall on different parts on my retina. So the part that you are looking at in the vision field, this X on here. If you decided to look at this X, this means that the light rays are falling on the part of the retina that can see better than the rest of the retina. What do we call this part of the retina again? This is my macula lutea and the central part of it that can see much better than the rest of the retina is gonna be my fovea centralis. Compared to this bird, the light rays that are coming from this bird are simply falling on my retina, still falling on my retina, but away from the fovea centrals. So can I still see this bird? Yes, you can still see it, but not as good as what you actually looking at. As Olivia said, it's the peripheral vision. All right, so if we're getting closer to the retina, how the retina going to look like under the microscope? Again, what we're looking at in here, this is the eyeball from inside. And I'm getting very close to check the different layers of the retina. I will see a pigmented a layer of pigmented cells. They have pigments. And the function here of those pigmented cells is to absorb the light that was not detected by the nerve cells in the retina. Another layer that I can see just in front of the pigmented cells are going to be the receptors responsible to detect light. And we've got two main types of those receptors. I have receptors that will look like rods and other ones that will look like cones. So I have those receptors that will be responsible to detect light. So we're gonna call them photo, means light, receptors. And again, how many types of photoreceptors, main types of photoreceptors do we have? We have ones that look like cones and ones that look like rods. So we've got the rods and cones. So I've got light rays traveling like this. So what happens? Those rods and cones will be able to detect the presence of those light rays and they will start 
to create an electrical impulse. This electrical impulse is going to be traveling to another layer of cells, nerve cells. Each of those nerve cells has two processes. One that will be acting as a receptive region, one that acts as a dendroid, and the other one acts as an axon. So those cells that will have two processes coming out, those are what we call the bipolar cells. And this is going to be the bipolar cell layer. So you've got an electrical impulse and action potential here that will be produced from those receptors according to what? According to the light wavelength they will be receiving. So I've received red, I've received blue, I received green. Those colors, those lights going to be stimulating the photoreceptors to form electrical impulses. So now the electrical impulse is traveling from my photoreceptors to my bipolar cells. So you see electricity is moving in the opposite direction to my light. So light is moving in, electrical impulse is moving Those bipolar cells are going to be then conducting their signals to another type of nerve cells that will have very, very long axons. And those axons all together coming from everywhere in the retina they will form together the nerves that will be sending out the signals to your brain. So the axons of those cells receiving the electrical impulse from the bipolar cells will be forming the optic nerve. So if I'm trying to draw the different layers of the retina in here. So you've got pigmented cells. Then you've got your photoreceptors, either rods or cones. And remember those Photoreceptors will be conducting the signals to nerve cells that did have two processes. We call those are my bipolar cells. Then the bipolar cells are going to be conducting the signals to nerve cells that did have long axons. And the long axons from those cells are going to be forming together. from everywhere from the retina forming together the optic nerves that will be conducting the electrical signals to the brain. Can you remind me what part of the brain is gonna be responsible to detect those signals as something that you can see? What brain area? What's the name of the area, specific area in the cerebral cortex? Anybody still here? Exactly, primary 
visual cortex. This is the one that will be detecting that you can see. And if a person got a stroke affecting the primary visual cortex, I would have vision loss, would have blindness. Looking here closer to this part in the retina. This part in the retina doesn't have photoreceptors. It has only the axons of those cells. And we call those cells, by the way, here, those are my ganglion cells. So this part in my retina doesn't have photoreceptors. It's only formed of the axons coming from the ganglion cells. We call this region in the retina, this is my optic disc. So how come you do have an optic disc in here, let's say. So this should be corresponding to a region in your vision field. So you see the light rays coming here from this region should not be detected because simply this part on my retina doesn't have photoreceptors. So no photoreceptors means you cannot transform the light rays into electrical impulses. So how come I don't have a visual, a vision field defect like this one, for example? So here is a person who has a vision field defect. He has part in his vision field that, he, that can detect light. How come I don't have something similar in here Although I do have an optic disc, or what we call the blind spot. Why we don't have this defect in the vision field, although we do have this blind spot, the optic disc? What do you think, any ideas? Any ideas? Why is it not present all the time, Najib? If we do, our brain adapts. How it adapts to it? Fills the gap. How it fills the gap? All the time, your eye is actually moving, right? All the time, your eye is moving. All the time, I have movement in my eye. So what happens to this blind spot? It's going to be receiving light from this region, then from this region as my eye moves, then from this region, then from this region, then from this region. So what happens? You are not capturing a single picture with your eye. You are recording a video. Think of it this way. You have very, very fast pictures that will be detected. And the blind spot gonna be changing its place with every picture. So as my brain, so this is my, so if this is a picture I'm receiving from the, I'm sending to the brain, so the vision field defect is supposed to be here. Then the next picture I'm sending to the brain, it moved in here, then it moved in here, then it moved in here. So my brain now will be overlapping all those pictures together and 
will be filling the gaps exactly as you've mentioned. Because I know what's in here from those pictures. I know what's in here from those pictures. So my brain will, by overlapping all those images together, it receives from the eye, it will be able to fill up all those gaps in the perceived or, or the received pictures. Does this make sense? Make sense? The main, main, main thing that allows you, that prevents you from having this vision field defect due to the presence of the blind spot is the continuous movement of the eye. Looking on here, what's going to be the direction of the light passing through the retina? First layer that it passes through is going to be the ganglion cell layer. Next is going to be my bipolar cell layer. And then we've got the photoreceptors. And finally, we've got here the pigmented cell layer. Compared to the electrical impulse, what's going to be the direction of the electrical impulse? It travels from the photoreceptors to the bipolar cells then to the ganglion cells. It moves in the opposite direction. All right. Easy, easy. All right, so moving on to the difference between the two types of photoreceptors, the rods and cones, and why the fovea centralis is going to be and why the fovea centralis is going to be able to detect uh, better pictures compared to the rest of the retina. So first, rods are going to be more numerous at the peripheral region of the retina. They are going to be located away from the macula lutea, and they are operating in dim light. They can operate in dim light. They will provide you with a non-colored fuzzy peripheral vision. Compared to the cones, they are going to be present in the macula lutea, concentrated in the fovea centralis, and they can operate in bright light. Those will provide you with a high acuity color vision. All right, so if we're looking on here, In order to understand, to have a better understanding of how, what is the difference between rods and cones, try to imagine you are sleeping in the middle of the night and you felt that somebody is standing behind the door of your room staring at you. So you wake up, turn on the light. And when you turn on the light, what appears, actually this was not a person looking at you, it was your coat hanging behind the door of your room.
So in a low light condition, I did have a low light condition on here. Am I able to see something? Am I able to see something here? Yes, I can see a person staring at me, but is it accurate? It's not accurate. But when I turn on the light, I can see what's exactly is behind my door. So who was operating in the dim light, in low light condition? It was my rods. They did provide me with a non-colored fuzzy picture. Compared to when I turn on the light, who is going to be operating now? It's going to be my cones. And if the cones are operating, they will be providing me with a high acuity colored vision. So I can see the details. I can see that this is a coat that hanging behind the door of uh, my room, not a person staring at me. All right, so remember, remember, co, 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 cones are the ones which are going to be detecting co, 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 colors. Why cones are detecting colors? Simply because we don't have a single type of cones. We have three different types of cones, which are detecting three different wavelengths of light. So light travels in waves, and each color going to be determined according to the wavelength of the light rays. So we have red cones, we have green cones, and we have blue cones. And by combining all the three of them, your brain can detect all the various colors that you can see. What if I have light that is infrared or ultraviolet? Can I see those lights, ultraviolet or infrared? No, I don't have receptors to detect them. All what's in between can be detected by my photoreceptors. All right, questions, questions. So if you put your hand in front of your face, so put your hand just in front of your face like this. Look at your hand, how many hands do you see? If you put just one hand in front of your face, how many hands do you see? You are looking at your hand. How many pictures of your hand do you see? What do you think? So look at your hand not something else. Look at your hand. You have your hand in front of your face. How many hands do you see? While you're looking at your hand, not at the screen.
one. Anybody else? Anybody else is trying this? One. So I can see one picture. Now look at the screen of your device while you're still having your hand in front of your face. Now you're looking at the screen. Make sure you have your hand between your face and the screen. How many hands, how many pictures of your hand do you see? I know that the ha your hand is gonna appear fuzzy, like it's not clear, but how many pictures of your hand do you see? You see? Two pictures of your hand. How come you see two pictures of one hand that you have in your front of your face? How many pictures do you detect for any object that you're going to be looking at? How many cameras do you have? We have two. We have two eyes. So how many pictures am I detecting of any objects that I will look at? How many again? So two. I'm detecting two pictures from everything I'm looking at. Why I don't actually see two pictures? Because yes, you're detecting two pictures, but your brain is gonna be overlapping those two pictures into one. So if I'm looking at, if I'm looking at a far object, the two pictures that will be arriving to my eye going to be very close to one another, so it's easy for my brain to overlap. What if I'm looking at a close object? If I have a close object in here, and I'm looking at a far object, and I have this close object closer to me, so the two pictures that will be detected by my eyes are not close enough for my brain to overlap as one picture. So my brain will do what? Will see two pictures of the same object because it did actually receive two separate pictures and it failed to overlap them. So in order to prevent this, when you are looking at a close object, what you're going to do, you're going to be rotating your eyes medially. We call this media rotation of the eye is convergence. You converge your eyes for you to detect two pictures that are close enough for the brain to overlap into one. And this is the idea of 3D movies. So when you go to a theater,
you are attending a 3D movie. Do you remember uh, what was the first 3D movie that you've ever seen? You went to this theater to watch. You remember? Doctor Strange. And for the rest of you, Disney. So for me, it was Spy Kids. This is the very first 3D movie I've ever seen in theater. Before Avatar. How the 3D glasses did look like? You know the Avatar movie? So the glasses, the 3D glasses, starting from Avatar maybe, it was great till now. But before that, the 3D movies did have glasses that will come with it and one lens of the glass was red and the other one was blue right did you see did you see those ones before when you take off the glasses when you take off those glasses what you will see on the screen you will see the main picture so whatever here, Let's say a dog here. And you will see the same picture in red. And another one in blue. Like this. So what is the idea here? So the idea is that I'm giving two different pictures to my, to my eyes. So the blue here is gonna be reflecting the blue picture. So you will not be perceiving this one. You will perceive, you will be receiving the main picture, the colored one and the red one. And the other eye will be receiving the main picture and the blue one. So I've received two pictures. One, which is colored from this eye and another one which is gonna be the red. It's not exact, it's very close to it. This one will allow you to see the colored picture and a slightly moved picture which is the blue on here. What your brain will do, your brain is gonna be receiving those two pictures and they are close enough so the brain will be able to overlap them creating a depth of the picture. Although everything is on a flat screen, nothing is, nothing that you're looking at has any depth for. You are just tricking your brain by giving each eye as an, a different picture than the other 
that when your brain overlaps, it creates a depth to the object, which actually, which actually doesn't exist. I'm creating a depth to the object by giving the, the brain two different pictures, but close enough for the brain to be able to overlap them. All right, does this make sense? All right, great, great. So we're looking here, this is my eye. I'm now looking at a far object. Let's say it's a candle. This candle is emitting light rays like this. So which light rays are going to be reaching my eye if it was a far object? The ones which are parallel rays. See here, the ones that will actually reach my eye are parallel light rays. Compared to if I'm looking at a close object. more divergent light rays gonna be reaching my eye. So it's gonna be more challenging for the eye to converge those light rays together for them to fall on the retina. Compared to here, I don't need much convergence power to converge those parallel light rays. So what would I do in order for me to converge those divergent light rays that are emitted from a close object, a near object? So what will I do here is I will be laxing the suspensory ligaments holding the lens of the eye by contracting the ciliary muscles in the ciliary body. And when I lax those suspensory ligaments, the lens is going to become more convex. So if I am pulling the suspensory ligaments like this, the length is going to be stretched and it's going to be less convex. In a closed vision, I will be laxing those suspensory ligaments. And as I lax those suspensory ligaments, what's going to happen to the curvature of my length? It's going to be increased. You increase the curvature and thus the convergence power. So now I have better convergence than before. And this is something that everybody will notice. So you'll see your grandfather, your father will be buying reading glasses. Why would they need reading glasses? Because over time with age, this lens is going to become stiff. So it will fail to accommodate. In other words, you can't increase the lens curvature. It's going to remain like this. So in order to increase the convergence power of the lens for me to focus those light rays on my retina, and for the 
for the vision to not be disturbed, what will I do? I will add a lens from outside to converge those light rays before they reach my own lens. So you see on here, would you need those reading glasses if you are not reading, you're looking, you are driving, for example. Would you need those reading glasses? What do you think? Would I need reading glasses if I'm driving? No, why? Because you don't need extra convergence power. I don't need it in here. It's easier if you're looking at a far object to converge the light rays on your retina, even when you are old. But what is your problem when you get older is with a close object. In a close object, I will need a greater convergence power to focus those light rays on my what? Easy, easy. What do we call this process again? It's accommodation. So seeing far objects from far away. So uh, do you mean uh, the person can't see or can see? Can see a far object from uh, a small object from far away. If a normal eye can't see it and a person can't see it so he has myopia he has short sighted as you see on here i have a myopic eye so if we're looking at this graph on here On this diagram light rays they would be converged they are gonna be falling on the retina this is a normal eye but this person this person has a longer eyeball than normal so the retina is located behind its normal position. So this is the retina on here. It should be on here. This is a new position of the retina. So the light will not be focused on the retina. So it's going to be disturbed. So I can't see well. Do I need extra convergence power or would I need to weaken the convergence power in this case if I have myopia if I have near-sighted vision I see better the close objects why close objects because they are emitting divergent light rays compared to a far object I have parallel light rays so the convergence is taking place before the light reaches the retina. So it's not converged on the retina. For you to see an object clearly, it needs to, fall, to be converged on the retina. But here in this case, it's not gonna be converged on the retina, it's gonna be converged before the retina, before it reaches the retina. 
So what do you need? Do you need extra conversions or do you need less conversions? You need less conversions. So I would be using a lens that will be diverting the light rays. So rather than receiving those parallel light rays, I will be diverting them before they reach my eye because I have more conversions than what I need. Do you have an actual problem with the lens of the eye? You don't have an actual problem with the lens of the eye. What you do have is a longer eyeball. So the eyeball itself is longer than it should be. So the light gets converged before it reaches the retina. So the picture of a far object is not gonna be clear because the light is not focused on the retina. All right, so a person with myopia, nearsighted vision, he will see better if he is looking at a close object. Why would he see better if he is reading? You will see a person, he is getting very close because he doesn't have his glasses. He is getting very close from the book for him to be able to see better. Why? Because the divergent light rays gonna be better for him because they will be falling on his retina. His retina is located behind the normal side. The exact opposite would be for the hyperopic eye. A hyperopic eye, the eyeball hair is too short. So the light is not gonna be focused on the retina, it's gonna be focused behind the retina. So the retina is, my retina is located in front of the normal location of the retina. So would I see as good as normal if the light is not focused on the retina? No, I can't see it. I can see well because the light is not focused on the retina. So do I need extra conversions or less conversions than normal? The light gets converged after the retina. So I need extra conversions power. I need to add a lens that converges those light rays before they get into my eye. So would this person see better a close object or a far object? What do you think? Look in here. This person, this person has a problem with what? With converging the light rays. Which ones? Which one is going to be emitting more converged light rays? A far object that emits parallel rays or a close object that emits divergent light rays? Which one is better for this patient with hyperopic eye? His problem is in converging the light rays. Which one is gonna be easier to converge? The parallel rays or the diverted, divergent rays? So it's gonna be easier for him to converge the parallel rays, parallel light rays. That's why the other name for the disease is gonna be far-sighted vision because it's easier for him he sees better a far object
Make sense? Make sense? But we can have a break for five before we discuss the hearing but right, we can have a break for five just to to refresh and then we're going to be back to discuss hearing and equilibrium right any questions before we go to a, a short break any questions All right, we'll see you in five.
All right, welcome back. Right, so we're starting with the hearing. In order to understand hearing, we need to understand two main properties of the sound. We need to differentiate between the pitch of a sound and the loudness of the sound. Pitch of the sound is going to be determined according to the frequency of the sound waves that will be created compared to the loudness of the sound is going to be determined according to the amplitude of the sound wave. So for example, if you have a guitar, are all the chords of the same thickness? What do you think? Are all of the same thickness? No. Some of them are thicker than others, right? So as I vibrate those thin chords, they will have faster oscillation. So they are going to be able to vibrate faster compared to the thick ones. They are much slower. And that's why you have the different pitch of the sound emitted from those different chords. Also, you see on here, the strength by which you're gonna be vibrating the chord is gonna be determining how loud is the sound that you're gonna be producing. So the more force that you're gonna be applying the, the louder the sound will be. So again, what's going to be determining the pitch of the sound? It's going to be the frequency of the sound waves compared to the loudness is going to be determined according to the amplitude of the sound wave. In order to understand Hearing, we also need to have an idea about how the, the anatomical structure of the ear. The ear is going to be divided into three main parts. We have the external ear, which is formed by the ear pinna, that will be collecting the sound waves to be conducted into a canal. We call this as my external auditory meatus or tube. Those sound waves that will be collected will be reaching the tympanic membrane. or the eardrum. The vibration of the eardrum is going to be conducted to the middle ear, where you're going to have three tiny bones, three ossicles. We call those ossicles, those are my malleus, ancus, and finally staves. So we're looking here, external ear is going to be formed by the ear pinna or article, external auditory meatus or external canal, and the sound waves that will be collected from the external auditory meatus will be allowing the vibration of the tympanic membrane or the eardrum. 
the vibration of the eardrum is going to be transmitted to three tiny bones in the middle ear. Those are my malleus, incus, and stapes. If you notice on here, the middle ear is going to be connected to the pharynx by the, tym the pharyngeotympanic tube. And this allows you to equalize the pressure on both sides of the tympanic membrane to allow free movement of the, of the eardrum. The vibration will then travel from the middle ear to reach your internal ear. Your internal ear is formed of three main organs. First one is going to be the cochlea. Second one is the vestibule. And the third one is going to be my semicircular canals. Each of the three is going to be responsible to detect a different sensation than the other. The organ that's going to be responsible to detect hearing is going to be the cochlea. This is where I have the organ of corti, which is the receptor responsible de to detect hearing. So the vibrations have traveled from the stapes, and now they are moving the fluid inside the cochlea. This is a transverse section of the cochlea. If you notice, the cochlea is going to be divided into three main compartments. Those are the scala vestibuli, scala tympani, and in between we've got the scala media. And inside the scala media, this is where I will have the receptor responsible to detect hearing. In order for me to hear a sound, what's going to happen? The vibrations transmitted from the eardrum to the malleus, to the incus, to the stapes, and then will travel through the oval window to reach the fluid of the scala vestibuli. And in order for me to hear the sound, it needs to travel from the scala vestibuli to the scala tympani passing through the scala media. Why do I need to pass through the scala media in order for me to reach the organ of corti? And the organ of corti on here that I see, it's going to be the receptor for hearing. What is the structure of the organ of corti? It's formed of hair cells, as you see on here. Each of them has cilia. And attaching the cilia to one another, you've got a gelatinous membrane we call this gelatinous membrane is my tectorial membrane. So what happens? The sound waves will be traveling through the scala vestibuli, passing through the scala media, and as they pass through the scala media, they will allow the vibration of the tectorial membrane. I will be vibrating this gelatinous membrane that is attaching the cilia of the hair cells. This vibration of the tectorial membrane will cause the cilia of the hair cells to vibrate. And the vibration of the cilia of the hair cells is what's going to allow the opening of the sodium channels that will cause the depolarization of those hair cells. So those hair cells will depolarize. And as they depolarize, the electrical signals going to be summated and collected by the nerve fibers to be conducted towards your brain for you to be able to hear. So again, again, how do you hear? First, the ear canal 
will be collecting the sound waves that will then be conducted to the external auditory meatus, causing the vibration of the eardrum. Vibration of the eardrum can allow the vibration of three tiny bones located in the middle ear, by malleus, incus, and stapes. Remember, you need to equalize the pressure on both sides of the tympanic membrane. That's why your middle ear is going to be connected to your pharynx through the pharyngeal tympanic tube. This vibration is going to be conducted to the cochlea located in my internal ear. When I have a cut section of the cochlea like this, this is how it's going to look like. You have a membranous tube. Outside of it, you've got the fluid that we call exolymph. Inside of it, you've got a fluid called the endolymph. This will allow you to divide the cochlea into three main compartments. We call this one is my scala vestibuli. This one is my scala tympani or tympani. And the middle one here, this is called my scala media. In order for you to hear a sound again, you need to travel from the scala vestibuli to the scala tympani passing through the scala media. What if it's too soft, the sound is too soft, or it has a very high frequency, it will fail to penetrate the scala media. And if it fails to penetrate the scala media, what's going to happen? You won't hear the sound. Why? Because you're only going to be detecting the, uh, those vibrations that will reach the scala media. Why specifically the scala media? Because this is where I have the receptor responsible to detect sounds. What do we call this receptor? It's my organ of corti. The organ of corti is formed of hair cells and attached to the cilia of the hair cells, we've got a gelatinous membrane. This is called my tectorial membrane. Again, those vibrations will cause the movement of the tectorial membrane and thus the movement of the cilia of the hair cells. When you move the cilia of the hair cells, what happens? You're going to be depolarizing those hair cells and those electrical impulses going to be collected from the hair cells and will be conducted towards your brain through the cochlear division of the vestibulo cochlear nerve. All right, what do you mean by vibration? What do you mean by vibration here? Five, seven, two, four, seven, three. To the hair cells on here. So the vibration of the cilia here, the vibration of the cilia, the kinking of the cilia is what causes the depolarization of those hair cells and those electrical impulses that you're going to be forming in those hair cells are going to be conducted through your nerve fibers to reach the brain for you to be able to hear the sound. All right, so I will be posting a PowerPoint presentation for you on Canvas that has all the 
most important diagrams that you should be preparing for this upcoming lab exam that will be available starting on this Tuesday. All right. Any questions for me today? Any questions? All right, thank you so much for attending the meeting today and we'll see you on Thursday. So again, I will be posting, I will be posting a collection of the most important diagrams that you should be preparing for this upcoming lab exam as a PowerPoint presentation for you on uh, is there any practice exam for this lab exam yes this is the one that i will be posting for you 